because of my addiction to drugs and alcohol, I've lost, like, severe, I've lost a severe memory loss. I am afraid that, you know, when everything is paid, things still aren't going to work out, that I'm going to come home from work one day or I'm going to answer the door and there's going to be a baseball bat in my face or a knife in my stomach. It was hell, and I thought of committing suicide every day. I wanted to die. Although there has been a notable decrease in drug and alcohol use among young people over the past few years, the figures on adolescent abuse and dependence on these substances have stayed relatively high. Indeed, both use of and addiction to cocaine at the high school level have increased substantially. What are the consequences of substance abuse? How will these consequences affect the user now and in the future? What are the risks to the user's health, both physical and mental? It is important that you examine these questions carefully because there is a choice to be made and it is up to you to make the right one. I don't like those drugs that keep you thin I don't like what happened to my sister First, we take Manhattan Then we take Cocaine. This is the drug that has been making the headlines. It seems to have a magic and glamorous image. The stars and the rich take it as a recreational drug. So it must be safe. Wrong. Cocaine is called the seductive drug because it fools the user into a false sense of well-being. Cocaine users feel no hunger when they haven't eaten, and alert and full of energy when, in fact, their body may need sleep. Yeah, two days now, day and night, solid. Mm. Nothing but work, 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 like uh, Johnny and Bell Boy. <laughs> the after effects of using cocaine can include depression and exhaustion, and yet the seductive appeal of the drug is so strong that experts and users alike agree that regular use of cocaine can result in a powerful dependence on the drug. I've done a lot of drugs. I've done, I've done everything. I've shot heroin. I've, I've done speed. I've, I've smoked pot. I've done hash, acid, you name it, I've done it. But I've never seen anything so addictive as cocaine in my experience. And I use drugs of every sort and type. But cocaine is like, it's like the devil. It's incredible. And it's slow in the beginning. It's like you're being hypnotized by this thing that you think you can control and all of a sudden it turns on you so fast and then it takes you on a ride, you have no idea where you're going to go. Physical effects of high doses of cocaine include high fever, severe changes in the heartbeat, breathing difficulties, and seizures. Side effects of cocaine use range from sniffles, lethargy, and irritability to insomnia, paranoia, hallucinations, and weight loss, depending on the amount and frequency of use. When I was hitting bottom, I looked 50 years old. I, my hair didn't shine anymore. The whites in my eyes were bright yellow. Um, I had lost so much weight that I looked anorexic, and that means I was so skinny I looked like a little skeleton. Um, I heard voices. I had audio hallucinations all the time. I heard people screaming in my head. Um, I shook uncontrollably. My muscles would spasm in my legs. When I would try to sleep, I couldn't shut my mind off and I would just cry and cry and cry and say, turn it off. And uh, it, was, it was hell. And I thought of committing suicide every day. I wanted to die. But there is a new and more dangerous form of cocaine now available. Crack. 
Crack is cocaine that has been chemically changed so that it crystallizes into a rock form that can then be smoked. Crack reaches the brain faster than regular cocaine, providing a more immediate and intense euphoria. That's Jim. That's Jim. Oh, Jim's gone. But this same rush puts the brain, heart, blood vessels, and other organs at serious risk. Crack is so highly addictive Dependence can occur within a few days of regular use. It wasn't in my plan. I didn't want to become a drug addict. I just wanted to have some fun in the beginning, and I wanted to belong, and I wanted to be a part of this, the group. Um, but what happens in the end is that you become outside from. You become more outside from than you were in the beginning to start with. You're so isolated from everything and everybody. Uh, you have no contact. You just can't because you're, you're so ruled by and controlled by the drug and, and the need to use it, that all you think about is using it. And it's, it becomes so expensive. I mean, in the end, I was using $1,000 a day. And I know kids in school now, 14 and 15 years old, that get addicted to it. And it doesn't take very long. It can take months. And you're, and you're spending that kind of money, and you either turn to crime you know, you have to turn to crime, especially if you're a kid. You're going to turn to prostitution. You're going to be dealing. You'll be stealing cars. You'll be stealing uh, from stores. You know, you don't know. You'll be stealing from your parents. You have to in the end. Yeah. And these are kids who normally wouldn't use this behavior. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly wasn't brought up to be like that, and I, and I never showed any signs of being a liar, cheater, or a thief. But I became that. I had to. Cocaine use overall is increasing. That in spite of the fact that the real risks of this drug are much publicized. For instance, one snort can and has killed, as it did in the tragic case of Len Bias, a promising young basketball star. It's not worth the hell of what happens to you after the fun stops to start it in the beginning. It's just not worth it. I mean, you're going to end up in three places that's guaranteed you once you start that fun. And that's in jail, in a mental institution, or dead, and it doesn't matter how old you are. Because once you start this drug, if you start at a really early age, you'll die at a really early age. Paul started using drugs at age 14. At that time, he was having difficulties at home, including the breakup of his parents, and drugs were his escape. Paul soon became a heavy user and couldn't hold down a job. To support his drug habit, he began to steal. Like it just snowballed, right? Everything went, you know, you get high, you party, you know, you want to steal a car, you're high, you get a nerve for it, so steal a car. Plus, I, you know, I don't know. Um, when I was high, I didn't care what happened, right? As long as I could get high again. Paul left home at age 16 and started dealing drugs. One time, he set up four dealers and took off with $8,000 worth of cannabis. To this day, Paul lives in fear of being tracked down by his ex-pushers. He'll never forget the night that one of those dealers caught up with him. Okay, see you later. I'm on my way. Yep. Catch you later, man. This is a, a scar from, like, I ripped this guy off for $1,000. He sent this other guy, and it was around 3 o'clock in the morning. We started fighting. And um, anyway, this is a bite he took out of me. A bite? A bite. So there are a lot of nuts out there, right? You don't know who you're dealing with because this guy was so whacked out, he didn't care. He just, like, he bit it, looked at me and smiled, right? How many stitches did you have in that? Um, 11 outside and I think four inside because it was right to the bone.
Incidents like those led Paul to become increasingly paranoid. But by then, Paul had no one to turn to. He had alienated his friends and family. Eventually, it seemed to him that the only safe place to hide was in jail. So he purposely got himself arrested. I thought this, you know, it would be safer there than on the streets because I didn't think, I, I thought if I stayed on the streets, you know, they were going to get me. One night after Paul's girlfriend broke off with him, he got as high as he could and stole a car. What followed was a high-speed police chase that ended up in a multi-car accident causing $28,000 worth of damage and almost killing three people, including Paul himself. That, Paul says, was the turning point in his drug and crime life. After that night, there was no way to get any crazier. There was nothing. I lived it to the limit, right? There was no more. It was over. Today, Paul has quit drugs and he's got a job. He's trying to build a new life. But soon, Paul will go to trial for the several offenses he committed the last time he got high. And, he says, he could be sentenced to up to three years in jail. Things are going good, then, and I go back to jail, I'm gonna lose it all again. I don't know if I lose it all again, if I can start over again. Although Paul is gradually paying back his ex-dealers, he says he will always live in fear of the many enemies he's made. I am afraid that, you know, when everything is paid, things still aren't going to work out, that I'm going to come home from work one day or I'm going to answer the door and there's going to be a baseball bat in my face or a knife in my stomach. Like, I never know. Everything I did, I did because of drugs. Like, uh, if I didn't pay my rent, it was because I needed drugs, right? I partied it away. If I didn't, like I lost this girl because of drugs. I lost everything, like I've got, I've got nothing. And when I look at other people my age and see what they have, and I threw everything away for drugs. I went to jail because of drugs, I lost all my friends, basically, because of drugs. Everything. <laughs> Everything. Allison started smoking cannabis at age 14. The reason, you know, that I started drugs was because I didn't like who I was, like I wasn't satisfied with who I was, um, I wasn't good enough. I didn't, you know, I, you always want to be with the popular people, you always want to, I didn't get accepted, and I wanted to be accepted, that's all I wanted, you know, just to fit in, so I didn't stick out. And so I, you know, chose drugs and I made a lot of friends that way. And I don't know, there's the pressure of school, like I never liked high school. <laughs> Reality was a bit much for me, you know, it was all too serious. But for Allison, what appeared to be a solution to her living problems became a problem in itself. At age 17, she had become an addict. I couldn't handle life as it was. Like, I, I was drowning myself in all those drugs and thinking and, you know, the fact that I didn't really have true friends that I could turn to and say, you know, can you help me? I need help, I need somebody to talk to, you know, there wasn't really people there. Most of them were just there for a good time and they didn't really care who you were or what you were about or, you know, whether you took off and, you know, like nobody would miss you anyway if you weren't around because they are more acquaintances and I found that out after I quit drugs. All of a sudden everybody just kind of disappeared. Allison tells us what she was going through when her drug problem was at its worst. I did drugs by myself, you know, when I would sit there and I just, I was just, I can't take this anymore, I can't take this anymore, like, you know, I can't, I've got to stop doing this, but I was so addicted by then that I couldn't stop. 
I just knew I had to stop because I had no control whatsoever. My mind was just letting loose and I just, I didn't know what was going to happen if I just kept going. Confusion got too much, frustration, everything, and I was totally isolated. By that time, I was totally isolated. I didn't know who I was anymore. I mean, I was a big piece of nothing. Finally, Allison admitted herself into a drug rehabilitation center, where, she says, she learned how to open up, how to express her feelings, and deal with them. Today, at age 20, Allison is off drugs. She's gaining self-confidence, and she's adjusting to a new life. But, she says, her period of drug use has cost her a lot. I've lost a severe memory loss. Like, I mean, I'm just making up for it now. I, uh, I still, to this day, don't remember half of what I did of those five years. And they were important five years. I mean, that's your teenagehood. That's about the most important time of your life. And I don't remember half of it, just because I wasn't really there. I wasn't really a part of it. I was just floating somewhere, you know. A lot of things that I avoided that I have to make up for now. And responsibility is the biggest one. Like, it's the hardest one for me, because that, that was like, uh, that was my pressure that I had when I was a teenager. It was responsibility, so I avoided it. But as I said before, you know, the more you avoid it, you know, the more it comes back and the harder it is to deal with. And so I'm dealing with it now and it's hard. It's really hard. I lost a lot, like I lost a lot of uh, strength, you know, that it's taken me, it's taken me months just to get where I am now and I'm not even half as far as, you know, I'm gonna, like, I mean, by the time next year comes, it's gonna be a whole new life again. I suffered a lot, it wasn't worth it. We asked Allison to tell us what she would like other young people to understand from her story. You can't grow when you're on drugs. I never gave myself the chance to gain confidence, so I never had any. Like, I mean, if you're doing drugs even two or three times a week, you're not giving yourself a chance to grow because when you're on drugs, you're not concerned with, you know, um, or where you want to be in the next 10 years or something like that. You're just concerned with now, like live for today. You know, and just make friends, you know, that are really friends. People that you know you can depend on. People that, you know, you can help and can help you. You know, people that you can trust. Being unique in your own way, being who you are, and, uh, making your own decisions and not, not doing it for other people, just doing it for yourself makes you the most important person to you and just by knowing that other people look at you like, you know, wow, I want to be like her. <laughs> Solvent sniffing is a serious and worldwide problem. Young people are especially attracted to solvents because they are inexpensive, available, convenient, and easy to hide. Model cement, or airplane glue, is perhaps the most commonly abused product containing solvents. Inhaling this or other solvents has a very rapid mood-altering effect. The user immediately experiences a feeling of intense joy or euphoria or a feeling of being separated from the world, of floating. Look at the bird. Look at it. I can do that. Perceptions are altered, and some users become overconfident, believing that they have superhuman strength, that they are virtually indestructible. What are you doing? I'm just like a bird. With this altered sense of reality, these people are extremely dangerous, both to themselves and to others. Long-term use of solvents has brought to light a number of serious health consequences. For instance, it has recently been discovered that heavy use of solvents results in permanent brain damage, which involves the shrinking of certain areas of the brain. In these comparative CAT scans of the brain, 
Enlargements of the dark areas indicate brain atrophy. You hold both arms straight, outstretched in front of you. This brain damage can cause loss of both memory and the ability to reason, tremors, and difficulties in coordinating body movements. Some inhalants cause kidney and liver damage, heart disorders, and anemia. Although some improvement in this health damage can occur after drying out, it has not yet been determined to what level brain or body functions can be restored. Inhalants are often put in a container or a plastic bag. As the drug is inhaled, one can fall into a deep sleep. In this way, many have literally suffocated themselves to death. Hey, you! What are you doing there? The most common form of death related to inhaling solvents is called sudden sniffing death. Stress or physical activity following inhalation of solvents results in severely irregular heartbeats, rapidly followed by collapse and death. Although studies into the problem are still new, so far several hundred deaths have been recorded due to solvent sniffing. At age 25, Steve is a recovering alcoholic. To him, that means he cannot have another drink for the rest of his life. Steve started to drink at age 15. Weekend drinking, he says, was a quick solution to some of his living problems. When I was feeling uncomfortable with a particular situation um, and I felt pain or, or frustration, uh, alcohol was a certain answer. It, it smoothed things out. When I was bored with my life and uh, uh, things were getting a little mundane and uh, uh, alcohol would uh, spice things up. Uh, I wanted every day to be an event. Uh, I just loved to socialize. I loved to party. It, it had to be fun, exciting. I liked the fast life. Eventually, Steve was drinking every day of the week. By living this way, I started to lose uh, the enjoyment uh, of simple things in life. Suddenly, I, I got myself into a rut where alcohol had to be with me uh, if I were to have a good time. At one point, Steve was drinking 10 to 12 beers a day. By then, he could barely hold down a job. Alcohol had began to, to run my life. Uh, it became... Uh, I planned my life around alcohol. Um, if I wasn't drinking, I was thinking about the next time I would be drinking. Um, or I was recovering from, from the night before. Took away all my motivation, all my will and my desires. I wanted to, to own a house by the age of 25, it was one of my goals, um, a nice car, um, uh, to, you know, to, to, to have the amenities of life. Um, I wanted success and uh, notoriety in the business world. And, and I fooled myself. A lot of times when, when I was drinking, uh, I, I thought it was just around the corner. Tomorrow would be the day. And uh, it, it wasn't. I wasn't living reality. At age 23, Steve realized that he had become an alcoholic. That scared the hell out of me because I wanted to be someone. You know, I want to be, I'm a good person. And that was not the way for me to, uh, to live my life. There had to be a better way. Uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, this is the report file. And uh, there are a few companies that have with the support of a self-help group, Steve has managed to keep dry for almost a year now. Career-wise, he's picking up where he left off, working hard at becoming successful in the business world. But Steve realizes that people's attitudes toward him have changed. Today I'm no longer a proven commodity as a human being. 
I am a, a recovering alcoholic. So for some time, there are going to be a lot of people that aren't going to trust me. You know, I have to prove to them that uh, I no longer require alcohol to live and that I can be dependable. Because a lot of people have the view of me that it, uh, I'm a nice guy, but uh, don't count on me for anything. We asked Steve what he had learned from his experience that he would like to share with other young people today. A lot of people, a lot of kids want something to take away the pain, the pain of living. There are a lot of people you can talk to if you can't talk to your family, find a teacher at school, you know, a sister. Talk out your problems. There are solutions. Alcohol is not the solution. Because if, it, if you choose to drink it for those particular reasons, um, sure, it's a quick solution, and you will feel better, and you'll like the effect. There's no doubt about that. But you're not solving anything. The problem's going to be with you tomorrow and the next day. And it, it's just going to compound, and it's just going to get worse. And uh, you'll be in a situation where you won't grow emotionally. You won't be able to take on that added responsibility. You won't become an adult. Uh, you'll have problems. If you find that you have to have alcohol to have fun, you, you have a living problem right there because you don't need it. There are other ways to enjoy yourself without alcohol or drugs. So be innovative, you know. Live life to the best of your ability. Be creative. Find things to do um, when al where alcohol isn't uh, required or, or isn't uh, used. Listen, uh, I'd be... Uh, I can't... Uh, condone or condemn alcohol. I mean, there are a lot of people that use it responsibly, and, and I think, uh, in a sense, it does have a place in society. Just be careful. Just because society does it, and your parents does it, do it. Just be cautious uh, and, and analyze your motives for drinking. You can enjoy life and cope with its difficulties without using drugs or alcohol. Firstly, remember that you are not alone in your anxieties, fears, and confusion. They are a normal part of adolescence and part of growing up. Secondly, don't bottle up your emotions. Share your problems or fears with someone you trust. Your parents, a friend, a family doctor, or a professional counselor. They know what you're going through, and sometimes, just talking about it can make you feel better. Thirdly, don't let yourself be pressured into doing something that you haven't decided to do. If friends are pressuring you into taking drugs or alcohol, make up an excuse, joke it off, or better still, just say no. More and more young people are saying no. Adolescence is a fascinating time of change where the body goes through tremendous transition and the mind expands with new knowledge and potential. The future comes alive with possibilities that are both exciting and at times a little scary. But the challenges of adolescence must be met in order to face this future. It is only by meeting these challenges that young people can equip themselves with the life skills that they will need to be fully functioning and participating members of society. Drugs and alcohol stunt this personal development, shrink the possibilities, and dim the future. The choice is yours.